right, so in Joshua chapter 9, we have basically just one thing happens for this entire chapter. It's kind of a longer chapter than some of the ones we dealt with. And um, there's still a few, a few major things that I see happening in this chapter. But basically what happens is the children of Israel are getting ready to continue their war, right? They've beaten Jericho, they beat Ai, you know, they had the whole fiasco with, with Ai and the cursed thing, and now they're getting ready to continue on in the battle, and all these kings of these of the different you know, nations within the land, they hear about what's going on, so they're gonna band together, they're gonna unify. They're gonna yoke up together to, to join forces, right? Because they're gonna have the best chance and winning a battle, right? I mean, it makes sense just in the wisdom of the world. Hey, let's let's band together and, and fight against this this force because they're coming to destroy all of us. So instead of waiting till they get to each one of our cities, let's let's yoke up and let's join together. So we see that in the first couple of chapter, first couple of verses, and then we see that um, Gibeon they hear about this, and instead of joining up with everyone else, they decide to go another route and basically say that. You know, they, they deceive them into thinking, oh, yeah, we're from really, really, really far away, you know, and, and they have all this stuff that they, they bring up to them saying, see, look, we, we travel really far. We just we just want to join up with you. We heard about the Lord, you know, like, like we want to make a league with you. And, um, of course, they make the league, and then they realize, no, they're actually not from really far away. They're one of the people in the land that God said that they were to destroy. So, uh, they, they got themselves into this position that's a really bad position to be in because now they're they're basically forced into sin. They're not going to be able to do what God commanded them to do. And if they do wipe them out, then they're going to go back on their oath and their promise that they made unto them. And we're going to go through all this and cover it. But that's basically the, the, the chapter in a nutshell, right? This is what happens in the chapter. Now let's dig in because I might not read every single verse over again. We just read every single one. But a lot of it is, um, you know, I, just, I want to focus on the main points that we're going to get to. So let's start reading here in verse number one. The Bible says, they came to pass when all the kings, which were on this side, Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys, and in all the coasts of the great sea, over against Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. Now, these people, we don't have any, like, I don't have any idea how well they might have gotten along before. But it is interesting how people will band together under a single cause, especially to fight God's people. Like, I, we see this happening so much, just, just with a lot of events that are going on these days, that people that hate the, the work that's going on right now, the new IFB, you have all these heretics now that normally probably wouldn't have anything to do with one another. But when they see the, the, the force that they're facing of, of men of God preaching God's word, they're going to band all together because they're going to think, hey, this is the best chance that we have. So you've got the, the Tyler Bakers and the Wesley Tomlinsons and all these other unsaved, reprobate heretics yoking up, joining together, trying to fight this battle. And obviously it's futile. It's in vain. You know, God is with us. We have the truth on our side. We're promoting God's word. And, you know, if God be for us, who could be against us? Amen. And we're going to see the exact same thing happen with the children of Israel. When God is for them, look, none, it doesn't matter how many people. It doesn't matter if the whole world joins up with the Canaanites. They're going to be destroyed. Because if God is with them, no one can withstand. No one's going to stand up against them. But that's, so that's what we see happening in this story, that they're, they're, they're yoking up, they're joining together, and they're going to fight. Verse number three, the Bible says, And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and Ai, they hear, they, they're utterly annihilated, they're utterly destroyed. Right? That's a pretty fearful thing now for Gibeon. They're probably thinking, we're next. You know, th this is coming to us. So it says in verse four, they did work wildly. And went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles. And it tells you all the stuff that they did, you know, their clothing, their food, it was you know, dry and moldy. So they made it look <coughs> like they had been on this really long journey. You know, so when they show up in the town, it's not like they have all this fresh food and all this stuff. Like, 
okay, yeah, you didn't come from very far away. You've got to live pretty close. You know, they, they, they put on their, their, their act. They put on their costumes to just make it look like, oh, yeah, we've, we've traveled for months and months, and now we finally made it here, you know, to, to just get this, uh, this treaty or this uh, um, what's the word? The, this deal, this agreement with them, not to uh, what is the word? Alliance. Yeah, the alliance, but the 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 Bible word. In any case. Yeah, no, in, in this in the in the passage. I don't know why I can't league. League. Thank you. The league, yes. All of those words were sufficient. They're right. The covenant, the promise, you know, the league. The league they made together. It's a pact, right? And and countries do this all the time. The United States does this. You know, it's a league that uh, the United States has with Israel, for example. You know, it's this, you know, we're allied with. So that basically what it is, is this agreement where... Okay, we're going to protect each other. One, we're not going to attack each other. We're, we're, you know, we're making this peace treaty where you're not going to attack us, we're not going to attack you. But also, in a league, what you're doing is saying, we're going to defend one another, almost as if you're like one nation or one country, saying, we are in agreement, we're joined together, so that way if someone comes to fight you, we'll go help you out. And if someone comes to attack us, you can come and help us out. And that is what... Uh, what they were doing here and what they were trying to convince them of because they were just worried for their lives, right? I mean, they, they see, hey, they've utterly destroyed these other cities and they're like, we don't want to be like them. So they go through all these efforts to deceive them, to trick them. And it says here, uh, let's keep reading in verse number six, the Bible says, and they went to Joshua unto the camp of Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel, we be come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league with us. There's the word. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? So right away they're thinking the right thing. They make the right thoughts. They say, well, wait a minute. How can we make this league with you? Because they know, they know full well what God commanded them to do. That the inhabitants of the land were to be destroyed. They were warned over and over again. You could read through the, the law of Moses. You could read through those books. You could read through Deuteronomy. You could read and see and say, hey, if you leave the children of the land, they're going to be a thorn in your flesh. They're going to they're going to cause you to sin. They're going to draw your hearts away from serving the Lord. God wanted them utterly destroyed and to have no remembrance left of them under heaven. And by leaving any of them to remain, it's going to cause a major problem for the children of Israel. Now, we know, those of us who have read your Bible already at least once know that, yes, they do leave some of them alive. Even in this chapter, we see now that they leave these people alive, and they end up learning the ways of the heathen. And they do end up getting their hearts taken away from God. And it does cause them a lot of problems, because God's word is true every single time about them. And all the warnings that he gave, all of them come to pass because it's the truth. Because that's what's going to happen, and that's what God warned them of. But they didn't keep that warning secure enough. And, you know, every time we read these stories, I understand none of us is perfect, but we just need to continually remind ourselves that God's word is true over and over again. And that these warnings, we can't just take them lightly. And it doesn't matter how, how much God has been with you up to this point in your life and how well things are going and how many victories you're having. We continue to need to be able to take heed and to be careful of our ways and make sure that we're doing everything in accordance to God's word and that we're not being sloppy about anything. Because if you're going to boil this up or chalk this up to anything, we're going to chalk this up to them being sloppy. And we're going to see later, I'm going to get to this, about them not seeking the counsel of the Lord when they make their decision. And it's an important decision that they make, and it's a costly one. Well, let's keep reading. So they say, they ask the question, well, wait a minute, what if you live among, among us? How can we possibly make a league with you? Verse number 8, and they said unto Joshua, we are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, who are you? From whence come you? And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come, because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him, and all that he did in Egypt, 
and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, the Sion, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtoreth. So notice they're, they're, they're kind of lifting him up. First of all, I say from a very far country. They don't even say, like, oh, yeah, we're from here. It's right over here. It's like, oh, we're from really far away. You know, be real vague about it. We're from, we're from really far, and we heard what you did to these two kings. Because obviously, they can't say that they heard about Jericho and Ai, because those are recent events. And they're like, wait a minute, you can't be coming from that far away if you just heard about these things. Right? But that was what they were really concerned about, is they saw Jericho, they saw Ai, they're like, we don't want that to happen to us. Of course they knew about those other battles, but they didn't really get scared until... They were encroaching and getting a lot closer to them. But they used those examples saying, oh, yeah, we heard what you guys did with those kings over there. You know, and, and uh, how God's with you. And they say in verse number 11, wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, take middles with you for the journey and go to meet them. And say unto them, we are your servants. Therefore now make ye a league with us. This our bread we took hot for our provision out of, the, out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry and it is moldy. And these bottles of wine which we filled were new, and behold, they be rent. And these are garments and our shoes are become old by reason of a very long journey. Now what we see here, one of the things that we can learn is, is part of the ways that deceivers work and liars work. And we can see a little bit of a, of a you know, modus operandi, the way that... The way that People who are going to try to deceive some of the things that they'll do. And we can learn a little bit from this. First of all, they were prepared to have a story for the questions that they figured they were going to ask right away. I mean, they knew they had to say they were from far away because they knew if they said they were from close that they would be destroyed. They already had knowledge of that. So there were a few things they had knowledge of. So they had to, of course, make this effort and this show to be able to demonstrate, oh, no, look, you know, to basically to... to, to um, squash any of their fears that they might have, any of their concerns. Now, obviously, one of the things they didn't do, the children of Israel, that is, well, was be very diligent in their inquisition of them, their questioning them. Because typically with deceivers, they'll have some of their bases covered, right? They'll know, they'll, they'll have a story figured out. But the more you press for details, on questions of things, or maybe separate a couple, because there's a few of them coming together, you can figure out that it's a deception a little, a little bit easier that way. But one of the things that we noticed, and one of the things that popped out to me, and this is the way that, that deceivers will work, is how quick they are to supply evidence. You know, saying, oh, look, well, well, look, we have this food, and look, this is moldy. I mean, how can it possibly be moldy? And, let, you know, and they're giving you this, this, you know, they're kind of overselling this thing, you know, oh, and, and our shoes, I mean, look at how worn and dirty and, and everything, and, and look at my costume, and look, you know, and look at this, and look at our bottles of wine, and, you know, just look at all this stuff. How could this have possibly happened unless we made this really great journey? Now, the deceiver is going to want to take you down that path, but we always need to be questioning the things that we hear, especially in a scenario like this. I mean, this is a pretty important situation that Joshua is in. Because they're deciding whether or not they're going to make a lead, make a pact, make an agreement with these people to not destroy them when they're on a mission to destroy. Like, that is what they are to do. They're, they're going out to wipe people out. And you, you need to have wisdom here and be able to, to handle these people, when you see this come up, and you see people just supplying all this evidence, you got to be aware of those type of people that are trying to convince you of something. And they just so happen to have all this evidence prepared. Because you got to start thinking, well, is that the only thing that possibly could have happened is that they took a long journey? Of course not, because that's not what happened. They just happened to take some old stuff and brought it with them. There was no real evidence that they made a long journey other than just what they're trying to, to, to prop up to show them. It's very weak. It's not real evidence. And when you're making very important decisions, especially, don't rely on such weak evidence. What Joshua ended up doing here was very foolish. He was obviously already aware of the possibility that these people might live among them. 
and thus cause a problem for him to carry out the command that God gave him. And he, he, that's, he, he thought about it. That's why he even asked them, well, wait a minute. Where are you from? But he was too quick to accept what they were saying. Now, the first problem that I have with them making this leap, the very first thing, is that what benefit is it really for the children of Israel to make a league with anybody in the first place? There is not. I mentioned earlier, your know, league is where they say, oh, if someone attacks us, you know, they'll come and help us out. If someone attacks you, we'll go help you out. Well, the children of Israel have God as their defense. God is the one leading them. God's the one that's saying, look, I'm your shield. I'm your butler. I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to defend you. So why in the world would they need any other country, any other support from any other nation in the whole world to say, oh, yeah, we got your back? Well, you know, God's got our back. Thank you very much. But instead, this, this league is only going to benefit the other people. So why are you going to bring that yoke and that burden on yourself to then sacrifice your own lives and your own resources to help some other country that who knows who they are? Who knows what God they serve? They don't, Joshua didn't know anything about them, and the little he thought he knew about them was a lie. And he goes and gets himself yoked up and bonded with this group of people and not doing his diligent research. So when you make important decisions, think about this. I think the, the, you know, the biggest application we can make, or the most obvious one to me, is you know, when you make a, like a covenant, is in marriage. Now, obviously, we need to be careful who we're yoking up with, who we're bonding with. Now, I'm not saying you've got to, you know, grill them and put them through the third degree and, you know, do <laughs> make, make it really awkward and weird and uncomfortable. But you ought to know who it is that you're getting married to before you get married. I mean, that's just, that's just a wise thing to do. You ought to know something about them. You ought to know more about them than just... You know, just, just being real quick, I, you, you gotta you gotta spend some time to get to know who they are, and uh, you know, for for the most important thing, make sure that they're safe, right? Nobody should be yoking up and getting married to someone that's not a believer if you're already a believer in Jesus Christ, because you're gonna be unequally yoked together. Now, turn if you want to Deuteronomy chapter thirty-three real quick. I just want to show you. What the, what the Bible says in one place about God being their defense and God being there for them. Deuteronomy chapter 33. I think it's very interesting the way this passage particularly fits in with what we're reading here. And we just need, we need to be aware of how deceivers will work and how, how liars will, will spin their lies and be ready to, to ask questions. When people, especially when people want something from you, because they came to them looking for a lead. They came to get them looking for something. Oftentimes, if I, if I at least have a little bit of time when, uh, and this hasn't happened in a while, I don't know, maybe I just haven't been in the, the proper situations, but when a panhandler or someone will come to me, you know, asking for money, I'm not always just a, a no person. Right? Now, most of the time, I am. If, if they're like some drunk or some drug addict and it's pretty obvious that they are, there's no way I'm going to give them any of my money. Because that's not going to help them one little bit. But some people you, you're not quite sure about. You don't know. I mean, there are people that do fall on hard times. And it's not a, it's not a sin to help out someone who's fallen on hard times. You know, I mean, there's, we, that's a whole other sermon kind of getting into all of that. But what I always like to do, if it is someone that I think might need a little bit of help, I start asking them questions. So, you know, I love the ones that will say, oh man, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on my way to get here, I just need a little bit of gas money. Right? How many times have you heard that? Just need a little, I just need five bucks for gas to get me to wherever. So, oh, so where are you coming from? Well, what were you doing over there? Well, we're, you know, and, and just start asking a lot of questions because usually... They're just told deceivers that it breaks down pretty quick. Some people have been pretty good. I, I still I still knew they were lying, but some people are pretty quick on their toes. If you lie for a living, they get better at it. 
But um, most of them, you'll still be able to trip up and just be like, yeah, don't, you know, don't lie to me. I'm not giving you my number. But um, it's usually when someone's coming to you asking for something, you know, just believe everything that they're throwing at you. Oh, man, my, my car broke down. My mom's in the hospital. My dog's about to die. And, you know, I need five bucks. <laughs> Look, here's my dog. Look, here, you know, whatever. They're trying to... They're trying to get something from you. That's exactly what these people are doing. Look at Deuteronomy 33, verse number 26. The Bible says, There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency on, thy sky, on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. They are going to dwell in safety. Why? Because God is with them alone. So the fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also as heaven shall drop down dew. Look at verse number 29. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help. Again, I mean, oh, in all of these verses, it's talking about God being their shield, God being their support, God being for them. And it says, who, and, and who is the sword of thy excellency, and thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. This is Moses' words. Obviously God's words, but it's in the book of Moses. Joshua should have known these things. Hey, let your enemies be found liars unto thee. Trust in God. You don't need to be making leagues with anybody. I don't care if they start lifting you up or praising you and saying, oh, how great your people are. Oh, we, we heard what you did to these kings. You know, we heard what great power you guys have. We want to be your servants. We want to just serve you and allow that to, to flatter you to then give them what they want. Say, so, yeah, okay, we'll make a league with you, make a covenant with you. They shouldn't even make a league with anybody. Now, of course, these people are liars. But even if they weren't, even if they were telling the truth, what value is in the league? You don't need their help. You don't need anybody's help. And you shouldn't be committing and pledging your support for someone else that you don't even know. There's pastors that are even guilty of this very thing of just pledging support before even knowing anything about a person. I, I had the experience of that happening to me, and I'm not, you know, I don't think this person is a bad guy at all. I think he's a great person. But I had a pastor who, who doesn't or didn't, I don't know if he does now, I have no idea, didn't know anything about me. Didn't know my background, didn't know what I believed, didn't really know anything. I just showed up to his church, and when, and when I let him know that I was going to be starting a church, he pledged this, oh man, we'll be there for you, we'll help, we'll go soul winning, we'll do this, we'll do that. And you know what, that's just foolishness. Now, it turns out that I'm not a bad guy, or right? at least I think all of you think that, right, because you're here. But I guarantee you there's a lot of things that we don't line up with. Now, they're not things that are going to make me not want to fellowship with him, but it might be the other way around. He might not want to have anything to do with me or have his name in, in any way whatsoever associated with having helped our church. So you can't be so quick to just pledge support to somebody when you don't even know them. I mean, he didn't even ask me if I was saved. He assumed it. I mean, someone comes into church, like, I know what it's like. You go to independent federal law Baptist church, you carry your Bible in, you're wearing a, you know, a suit and a tie, you come and you sit down and you know the song, you sing the song, you say amen, you know, you're, you're, you're paying attention, you're going to assume, it's natural to assume that someone is saved, they're born again when they come into your church. But you can't make that mistake. Because I can't tell you how many times I've seen people come in that looked well-churched that were unsaved. And I don't know if I specifically asked every single person in this room about your salvation, but I think I came close to it if I didn't ask everybody. Because when I first started the church, I was trying to just, you know, I, didn't, I don't want to assume anybody's saved for sure without knowing some kind of testimony, hearing it from their own lips. I mean, just because you follow the new IFP movement online, or you listen to Pastor Anderson, or you listen to Pastor Mary or anybody, you can't assume that someone's saved. 
It's actually kind of incredible because I've heard people give testimonies of listening to sermons for years that were unsaved. That they're like these repent of your sins people. And I'm just thinking like, whew, the sermon's just going right over their heads. And they, but see, they like the hard preaching. They like the preaching on sin. So it's obvious they weren't listening to all the sermons, but a lot of people are unsaved. So we can't just, just you know, assume that. And especially if you're going to pledge support, if you're going to pledge of yourself to someone else and kind of get into a yoke like that and get into some form of agreement, know who it is that you're talking to, at least to the best of your ability. And the greater the decision, the greater the, the yoke, the greater the commitment that you're going to make, the more time you need to invest and just make sure you got this right. So I mentioned the first thing that they did that was I didn't like, I don't think that they should, but anyways, it was just to get into that agreement at all, because they don't need to be in a league with anyone. But even worse, if you go back to Joshua chapter 9, even worse, they didn't bother to go to God with such an important decision to make. Joshua chapter 9 verse 14 says, and the men took of their victuals, so they take of their evidence, right? They take of their, they say, oh yeah, look, this is dry, it's moldy, it's all, you know, that's what they take as sufficient for them to just say, okay, yep, you're telling the truth, we'll make a league with you, we'll make this pact or this agreement with you. Now, nowhere did God ever say, hey, go make yourselves leagues with any nation. God never told them to do that. This is something that would be new coming outside of God's word. And they're just, just taking these riddles and saying, oh, okay, yep, that's enough for me. It says, ask not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And that was their biggest mistake right there. Even if they didn't understand that they don't need to be making leagues and agreements with other people, they dead sure should have been going to God about this first before making an agreement. And we need to remember that. I mean, in all aspects of our life, we ought to be seeking counsel from the Lord in all that we do. That we can get this wisdom and light and guidance and especially in the important decisions that we make in our life. Hey, what's the right thing to do, God? God, help me out. God, I'm going to go to you. God, I'm seeking your advice. We're seeking your wisdom. Now, at this point in time, God could have literally given him a word like that would be from the mouth of God if they would have asked. But they didn't do it. Uh, I'm just going to read some of these for you just on the, on the counsel of the Lord and how, and how strong and sure that is, which is why we need to continually go to God for our counsel, for our advice. Psalm 33, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Proverbs 19, verse 20 says, Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. God's counsel, the Lord's counsel is going to stand. It stands the test of time. Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 1. Turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. But in Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. So our rebellious children, children that are being disobedient, if they're not going to God to seek counsel. Yeah, they might seek counsel, but they're not going to God. And that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. That walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. All throughout the Bible, we see Egypt as a picture of the world, and as a, a wicked nation. They're always a wicked nation. They're people that, that represent the wisdom of the world, the strength of the world, that, that it, they're, they're anti-Christ, they're anti-God. And he's saying, look, you guys want to go down into Egypt. You want to go get strength from them and, and make leagues with Egypt and rely on Egypt to be your strength because they're so prosperous and they have all this military might and everything else. And he's saying, you're not coming to me, you rebellious children. 
He said, as a result of that, when you go and you go around God and you try to make your own strength with the flesh of this world, instead of putting your strength and your trust in, this, in the arm of the Lord, he says, he's going to take that strength, like the strength of Egypt, and just turn it against you and, it, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to wipe you off and it's going to come back around your own head. Because that's not sure. Because their strength is not everlasting. Because their strength doesn't endure and they're a wicked nation. And when you go to the world, you can't expect, you know, the world to hold their word. Now, is God true to his word? Absolutely. God, we know God cannot lie. God's promises are, are more sure than anything. But what about the, the, the men of the world, the nations of the world? I mean, think about it. The, the politicians of the world, they're all just a bunch of liars. All, I don't care what country you go to. Every country in the world, the world leaders are all a bunch of liars. How much is it even worth? Literally, how much is it worth for any country to say, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll have your back? Is that really worth a lot? Especially when you compare that word to the word of the Lord. When God's like, I'll be your defense. If I live in a, much, in a much smaller country, I would be I would I would hope and pray and try to reach as many people in my country saying, you know what, let's not seek the defense and the shelter of the United States of America. Let's let's just follow God. Let's just band together and say, you know what, the Lord's our God. Let's not trust in the military might and strength of the United States because you know what, that's gonna crumble. And if we're doing right by God. The entire United States military could come after us, and we'd be just fine. That's the attitude that we need. I mean, that's the we need to have in the United States. That's the attitude everyone ought to have. And not to trust in Egypt, not to trust in that, that arm of flesh. The arm of flesh will fail you. The reason why King David was so successful as a king and he stayed on the throne for so long all the way to his old age and he had so many victories and victory after victory after victory and defeated his enemies just time and time again is because he continually sought the counsel of God. Always, Lord, should I go up against this people? Lord, should I go here? Lord, should I do this? God, will you deliver this people into my hand? With like every battle, he's going to God and saying, God, will you do this? And he's listening. When God's saying, yep, go, I deliver over here. He said, no, go, no, don't go yet. You go over here and, and, and wait. Okay, that's what he did. And he followed the counsel and advice of God. And that's why he was so successful. He had great success because of that. And similarly, on the other side, the downfall of Asa, and that's what we're going to look at in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. The downfall of King, because King Asa was a righteous king. At least he started off great. He ended terribly. He started off great in trusting in the Lord and, and getting victories through his faith in God to be his strength to, for God to be with them, for God to help them and to defeat their enemies. But the downfall of Asa was when he stopped trusting in the Lord and seeking counsel from the Lord and ended up having a bitter attitude even towards men of God. <clears throat> Let's read here in 2 Chronicles 16 verse number 1. The Bible says, In the 6th and 30th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah, to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. So he's trying to set up this siege, right? Uh, Baasha is, is setting up a siege against, against Judah to try to squeeze them out, to slow down the resources, right, so no one could come in and out. Silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee, as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go break thy league with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. So get what's going on here, because there's a lot, of, a lot of things to learn from what happens just in this one story, especially when it comes to making a league. The king of Syria has a league, both with Judah and with Israel. He's got to lead with both people. We see here the king of Judah is taking money out of the house of the Lord to pay this other nation. 
nation to yoke up with him in order to defeat this enemy that's come against them, this wicked King Baasha, king of Israel, who's come against them. Now, going back to just having leagues and why it's, why it's just not a good idea at all, if he didn't have this league to begin with, it may not have been an option for him to even think about, hey, I'm going to go take money out of the house of the Lord and give it to this guy because we have a pact. We have an agreement. He's going to come. He needs to come over here and help defend me. If that wasn't even on the table, right, it may not have happened. He may have just been like, well, we got to go trust in God because we don't have anyone else to, to, to look to for our protection. We have to look to God, which they should have been doing from the beginning. And he did do earlier and, and actually got victories. But then we see, he says, hey, here's some money. Break your promise to them. And what does he do? He breaks his promise to them. Okay, yeah, we don't have a league with them anymore. And then he goes and attacks them. Remember what I was saying about making these leagues? Well, how good is that really? It's only good until someone else comes with some more money. He says, oh, okay, here. You can, you can buy my... my uh, my trust, you can you can buy my confidence. It comes and it goes. So he makes a league, and uh, and he trusts in the king of, of uh, Syria to help him out here. Look at verse number four. It says, And Ben Hadad hearkened unto King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they smote I, John, and Dan, and Abel, Ma'am, and all the store cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Baasha heard it that he left off building of Ramah and let his work cease. Then Asa the king took all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof, wherewith Baasha was building, and he built there with Geba and Mizpah. Now, it worked. Sometimes when you, when, you, when you do things that are wrong, in the short term, it'll work, Right? But what he did displeased the Lord, and we're going to see here, it ultimately doesn't end up very good for Asa. Because the, the root of the problem was in his heart anyways. Not going to the Lord for their, for their help and just, just foregoing that. And when he gets rebuked, it gets even worse. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, Therefore is the host of the king of Assyria escaped out of thy hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth, thou shalt have wars. So he is being punished for not trusting the Lord. Yeah, yeah, it worked out for him that time. And it, was, it cost him a lot. But now he's saying, you know what? You're just going to continue to have wars. You're so worried about this one battle. When you've already been proven to have victories over even a, a, a bigger enemy. The, there are bigger enemies that he's fighting against. And now he gets worried. Now he runs off to the world. Now he's just, now the, the prophet tell him, you know what? Now you're just going to have wars. And you've done this to yourself. You brought it on yourself. Verse 10 says, then Asa was wroth with the seer. He was, really, he was really angry with this man of God, the prophet, and put him in a prison house. For he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. Talk about your heart being just just completely backwards and not able to receive rebuke or correction. It made him really, really angry. And you know what? That's usually how people will respond to a rebuke. You're either going to, one, be humble and accept it, or two, you're going to get really, really angry and just get really mad. And it's going to drive you crazy. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can all recognize it. If you ever hear preaching, and it's true. Asa knew that this was true. He wasn't a dummy. He knew that it was true. He already has seen the, the truth of God. Asa was a righteous king in, in many, many ways. But he was in the wrong here, and he just became stiff-necked and decided not to, not to want to listen to it. And he got so angry, it says, that he ended up oppressing some of the people, too. 
So he started turning into like this tyrant because his heart was just turning cold against the word of God. And we need to be able to recognize too, hey, if you ever find yourself just getting really angry at some preacher, it doesn't matter who the preacher is. If it's coming from the word of God, you might want to just take heed and take a step back and be like, am I being like Asa right now? And just, and just getting real upset and angry at something just that's true. But oftentimes what people do is then they'll start attacking other believers. Just just other people that, that may have nothing to do with their situation. It's going to just turn into more oppression. Just because you're angry and you're going to take it out on other people. And that's what Asa did. Verse number 11 says, And behold, the acts of Asa, verse last, though they were written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel, Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet. Until his disease was exceeding great. So Asa has this great disease. This one little, little bit that's given to us in this chapter. It says, yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. And guess what? That didn't work out for him either. We need to be ready to seek unto the Lord for everything, especially with our health. No, I'm not saying don't ever go to a doctor. Okay, well, I, don't, I don't believe that to be true. There is a purpose and a need for people to see physicians. There are physicians that have value. There are a lot of physicians that don't have value. But the, the point of this is that if we're not putting God first, and if Jesus Christ doesn't have the preeminence in your life, you can't just trust that man is going to be able to save you at all. Man can help you, but if, but if God's not going to be there to, to be your strength and to be the one you're trusting in, you got nothing. We need to go to God first. Let him have the preeminence with health reasons. Could God have healed the disease that Asa had in his feet? Of course he could have. Absolutely. Can God still heal people today? Absolutely. Yes, he can. I believe that. No. You know, we're not a Pentecostal church. We don't we don't believe in a lot of the, the weirdo things that they do. We don't believe in these faith healers that, you know, you're gonna walk up here, I'm gonna smack you in your forehead, and oh man, you're healed. You know, it's amazing. They don't ever go to the hospitals. I don't know why. Why don't they ever just go to the hospital? Oh wait, because the actors aren't there. That's right. But God can heal. Turn if you into James chapter five in the New Testament. This is what we're admonished to do in the church. We know that we serve a powerful God. God that's capable of doing anything. And ultimately, what does God want? He wants us to worship Him. He wants us to love Him. He wants us to serve Him. He wants our attention. He wants us to recognize Him for all that He's done for us. He really doesn't ask a lot of us. But to be recognized and appreciated, you know, just pretty much you think about if you have kids, what do you what do you want from your kids? It's very similar. Especially if the kids start growing up. You, you want them just to be spoiled brats that just are given everything and then they just never care and never say thank you and never do anything right and never listen to what you say. And don't take your instruction and don't, you know, and then they expect you just to be there for them just no matter what. I mean, obviously you're there for your children, but you know what I mean? Like if they're, you know, they're digging themselves in ditches, they're themselves into problems and they're not, they're not giving you any regard or any respect. Parent might be more willing to say, you, hey, you got yourself in this problem. You got to learn this lesson because I've been trying to teach you this lesson and tell you so you didn't have to learn the hard way, but you didn't want to listen. And now here it is. It's come. It's come your way. James chapter five, verse number thirteen. The Bible says, "Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray." Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. 
If you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then it goes on to explain how uh, Elisha was a man, you know, subject to like passion. He said he prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain. And it demonstrating the power, saying, look, you need to be praying. You need to have people praying for you. You need to be praying for one another and pray for the sickness and pray for your disease. Go to God and have other people go to God for you. Why? Because it works. Because it's powerful. Because Elisha was able to make it not rain for years. Through a prayer. Through asking God. We're saying, God, don't let it rain. We go to God first. In our health, we ought to be going to God first. There are times when I will seek the assistance or aid of, of either a physician or some type of, of medication or something along those lines to help the problem that I get. But you know what the first thing I do? I'm going to get on my knees and pray to God. Even things as little as a headache, you know, whatever. You know, sometimes... There's lots of ways to, to remedy a, such a, a minor thing, right? But we ought to have that in, in our minds of thinking, hey, we ought to be going to God first with everything. Give him the preeminence. And trust that he can do all things. Know that he can do it. It's not just a little ritual saying, oh, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to go to the doctors and just trust the doctor. Oh, the doctor can do it. No, we're going to pray to God knowing that he can heal, knowing that he has power, knowing that he can do whatever he wants to do. And then after I pray, or after we pray, we go out, and, you know, we're still going to try to do what we can do to, to, to help ourselves. Right? We don't just, just throw up our hands. We, do every, we ought to be doing, to be diligent about, about being sufficient, self-sufficient, trying to do everything we can, but the first thing we're doing is we're going to God. And we're asking Him for help. Turn to it to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Do we go to God for health reasons? Do we go to God for everything? The important decisions that we need to make we need to be able to trust God. We need to put him first. We need to be getting the counsel from the Lord. Now, you might be thinking, well, how do we do that? You know, Joshua should have gone to God to get counsel. He forsook the counsel of the Lord. He didn't ask for it. If he would have asked for the counsel of the Lord, he would have gone to the priest or would have, you know, gotten his, his word from the Lord himself or whatever. I'm going to do. But what do we do today? Well, when we go to get counsel of the Lord... We sh we're not going to expect to hear an audible voice. Right? And if you do, that's another problem. <laughs> You're starting to hear voices. But we have all the counsel we need at our fingertips with the direction of the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, verse number 10. The Bible says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Look at verse number 15. But he that is spiritual judges all things. Now, if you're spiritual, you have the spirit of God. You're getting wisdom from God. How are you able to judge? Judge means you're able to make good decisions. <clears throat> you're judging right from wrong. You're judging and making good choices because you're able to judge all things because you're spiritual, because you're walking in the spirit and God, the Holy Ghost, is leading you. He that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 
We have the mind of Christ. We have God's word and God's wisdom to give us all that we need to make the decisions that we need to make in our life. We need to rely on the principles and on the truths found in this book as well as the guidance of the Holy Spirit to help to guide us into all good decision making in our life. And you think that the, the more important the decision, the more we need to be relying on biblical principles and biblical truths. I've been undergoing this process personally. This hits home even, you know, just for me, because a big decision for me is providing for my family, working at a job. I was just talking about that earlier, trying to find employment. Because unfortunately right now, the church isn't able to support my entire family. I cannot make this just be my living right now. There's other needs that the church has. It's, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily cheap to support my family and everything right now. So I need to, one, apply principles. I'll just go through a little bit of this mindset with you on, on how I use, try to use biblical principles to, to go to God first and seek counsel of the Lord on what's the right thing to do. Because God's not going to tell me, oh yeah, make, sign this application right here and work for this company right there. You know, I'm not going to hear that. I'm not going to dream one night and be like, oh, I'm going to email this company right here and send them my resume and they're just going to give me a job. That's not how it works. So you start off with all the biblical truths and principles. One, knowing that I need as a man to provide for my family. That is a very fundamental, foundational truth that is found in Scripture, and that I need to be willing to work hard to support my family, as well as to work for the Lord. Not even just being the pastor, but just being a church member, just being a believer in Jesus Christ. We need to be able to work hard, especially the you know, men, work hard to support your family, and work hard to serve the Lord. We all have service to the Lord to do, whether you're a pastor or not. And we need to be willing to do that type of work. So that's number one. Number two, I have to consider, you know, even personally, being a pastor, what is my workload here? I can't let, you know, just pursuing after, you know, too much money or, or you know, obviously I need to feed my family. I trust in God. I pray to God every day. God, you know, help me out. God provide for me. And he will, but he's not going to just let me be lazy either. I need to work. I need to roll my sleeves and get to work. So it's not that hard to come up with a, a plan or decision to just say, hey, okay, well, I'm going to work. And I already know right now, I have it settled in my heart that I'm only going to work another job for as long as I have to to support my family. And once I'm able to not, you know, to be supported here, then great. Then I'm done. Then I'm not going to be, you know, splitting up my time at all. It's going to be all going one direction. But because I need to provide for them, I need to work. I need, you know, it's, it's very simple. So what I do then also is I look for jobs that are going to work with putting God first. I can't take a job that's going to keep me out of church on any church day at all. I can't do it. That's, these are principles I find in Scripture. I'm not going to, uh, you know... Put God in the back seat. I am going to work and support my family, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to give up soul winning. I'm not going to give up preaching. I'm not going to give up church. I'm not going to give up any of these things for employment. As important as employment is, God's more important. Right. right. And of course, I'm not going to be looking for a job or even applying for a job that's just totally wicked company or industry or something like that, where they're just. Just supporting all kinds of, you know, just promoting filthiness and whatever. Right? I mean, that that should go without saying. Those are pretty basic principles on where you're doing. I don't care, you know, if uh, you know, being a computer person, if some if some internet porn site wants to hire me, something obviously is going to be like, no. <laughs> I hope you, you know, I hope I hope your whole site is destroyed and, and you know whatever goes to hell. Those are the types of decisions. That we need to make, but we need to be going to God first. Like I've been praying, you know, because we don't always know exactly where things are going to lead us, but we pray that God will lead us, that through using wisdom in our choice making, as much as we can, as much as we've learned from the Bible, 
you just keep going through that. You just pray, God, just, just keep leading me. Help me to know what's the right decision to make here. Give me the, the wisdom to do this. And I believe, as the Bible says, that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. That he will direct our paths. He will do it. If we're seeking him first, if we're going, if we're going to God for our counsel, he will help us to make those decisions. Even if you're not fully, I believe, I, even if you're not fully conscious of the, 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 the full picture of where you're going. If you're doing your best to apply God's word to decision making, he will lead you and not steer you away. Let's keep it, uh, go back to Joshua chapter 9. There's, only one, there's one more point I want to make here from this, this passage before we're done. But it's an important one. Obviously, a major failure here was not seeking counsel of God to make this treaty, to make this pact, to make this agreement. Verse number 15, And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live, and the princes of the congregation swear unto them. And it came to pass at the end of three days after they had made a league with them that they heard that they were their neighbors, and that they dwelt among them. Oops! Already made the deal. Now they find out, oh wait, you actually live among us? And the children of Israel journeyed and came unto their cities on the third day. So it didn't take them, you know, three months to get to them. It took them three days. Sorry, but your bread and your shoes and everything else are going to be all dry and moldy and worn out after three days of, of, of traveling. When you think about go, go hiking, get on a horse or whatever and travel for three days. Bring, bring a loaf of bread with you to see how, how bad it is. It's not going to be bad. It's going to be fresh. And it says, uh, and that they, you know, they were lied to. And the children of Israel, during, uh, verse number 18, start reading there. And the children of Israel smote them not, because the princes of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation murmured against the princes. So now, you know, the people, as I was saying, that the congregation, the people are angry. Because their princes or their rulers, the people who were in charge, made this agreement. And now they're saying, you know, you guys got deceived? Well, what's the matter with you? So they're all disgruntled and upset because, obviously, they were fooled. They were tricked. Verse number 19 says, but all the princes said unto, the, unto all the congregation, we have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. Because they wanted to go and destroy them. They said, well, they're right here. I mean, these are the people we have to destroy but they had to, to warn them and say, no, look, you know, we made this promise. You guys can't go and do this. The importance of an oath in the Bible trumps just about everything else. So you're going to find that. And, and this is a very important point. It is so important to have integrity, to say what you mean, and to keep your word. At a time where people are just treating promises and just the statements that they make so flippantly, we need to make sure that we are we are going to be a man or a woman of our word. That when you say something, you will follow through and do it. And a lot of people don't have the character anymore to even follow through and do things. And you know what? This is so important on so many levels. As a parent, you say something to your children, you better follow through with it. Because when you don't follow through with it, they don't respect you. But it's not just your children. Anybody. If you start making promises to people, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and you don't do them, that person isn't going to respect you anymore. But not only that, how about this? When you start you know, treating your words as being not that important, and then you really want to try to tell someone something very important, like how to be saved. But your testimony with them personally is, how willing are they going to be to even listen to what you have to say? It cause a lot of damage. Think about how important God's word is. God's word has to be perfect or it's not God's word. God's word is what, is what we hear and believe in order for us to be saved. God is very, very careful and very clear with his words and never goes back on any of his words. 
And he expects us to do the same way. I mean, Jesus Christ is the Word of God. The Word is held up and elevated so high. The Bible says that if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of his book, he's going to take away his part of the book of life. God holds his Word so high that it is just damnation for the person that's going to corrupt God's Word. The, the most severe thing you can do is just saying, you are just automatically going to go to hell. And there is no other way around that at all. So you mess with my words, you're going to hell. And similarly, not exactly the same, similarly though, we need, we need to take, treat our words very carefully. Because what do you really have? What do you really have in this life? How are you going to impact other people? It's with your words. At least in any meaningful way. If you're going to impact someone's life in a meaningful way, it's going to be with your words. We need to be careful with the words that we choose. We need to be very careful with the promises and the oaths that we make, that we are true to those. There's some examples in the Bible. I'm just going to go over a few real briefly. Deuteronomy 23. Turn, turn if you would, to uh, Judges 11. We're almost done. Judges 11. I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23, 21 says, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require of thee, and it would be sin in thee. Ecclesiastes 5, verse number 4 reads, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel, oh, that was an error. Oh, that was a mistake, is what he's saying. Oh, oh, oops, I didn't mean to say that was a mistake. It says, wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? You're going to make God really angry by just saying, oh, oops, I didn't mean to say that. That was just, that was just a mistake. Oh, I, I, I didn't really mean that. You better, you better mean what you say and say what you mean. Because God has no tolerance for that. God expects you to pay the vows that you make. We see an example here in Judges 11 of a man that made a really stupid, foolish vow. His name was Jephthah. He was one of the judges of Israel. He made a vow unto God. Saying, God, if you, if you, you know, he's going into battle. God, if you deliver this enemy into my hands, you know, you give me this victory, I'm going to offer you a sacrifice. And we'll, let's see what he says. Look at verse number 30, Judges 11. It says, And Jephthah bowed a bow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's. And I will offer it up for a burnt offering. That's his vow. That's his promise. Now let's see what happens after the victory. Verse number 34. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. And she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. It came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. You might want to say, well, God, I didn't mean that. I mean, of course I didn't mean my daughter. Of course I didn't mean that, God. God, you know I didn't mean that. So we're just going to uh, forget that ever happened, and we're just going to take the second thing that comes out to meet me, and that's what I'm going to offer. You know, that's what a lot of people might want to do today. But you know what? Jephthah understood the importance of, of making a vow. And I'm not saying it's right for him to offer up his daughter, but I'm also saying it was not right for him to make such a stupid vow. That's where he got himself into trouble. He forced himself into a no-win situation. Because he could have broken his vow unto God, which is a no-win situation. Or offer up his daughter, which is also not a good, you know, not, not, a, 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 not the right thing to do. I mean, there was no right thing to do. But what he did here was he did keep, he was at verse number 39. It says, and it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. He kept that vow 
It says, she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel, you went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, for four days in a year. Why? Because the vow is so important. That oath is, is held so highly, even in God's eyes, that, that when you make a vow unto God, that is important. And people are forgetting that these days, especially when it comes to the vow of marriage. You are vowing to be with your spouse forever, or at least until one of you dies. When one of you is not dead and you're breaking that vow, that is a serious, serious sin. I mean, Jephthah did what was willing, you know, to offer up his own daughter not to break a vow to God. Yet people today are breaking their vows before the Lord every single day. The best advice. Now, we ought to be careful with our words and definitely with our vows. But I mean, the things that you say can be construed as, you know, if you're making a promise to someone, you don't have to say, I vow or I swear to God that I will, you know, you don't have to use those words if you're promising someone something. That is still a vow. We need to be careful about that, too. The best thing to do is to not make the vow at all. This is the advice that Jesus Christ himself gave in Matthew chapter 5. Verse number 33, he says, Again, ye have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thy oaths. It's true, right? Don't make yourself a liar. Just pay what you vow. But I say unto you, swear not at all. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these, come with the beacon. And just speak truth. Don't vow. You don't have to make any special promises. You don't have to say, oh, I swear on this, and I swear on that, but this is true. Just speak the truth, and then your, your yes and your no should be good enough. Because you're someone that when you speak, it's the truth. Very matter of fact, and people can trust you at your word. You don't have to go on making any extra promises. In fact, what, what, when people have a tendency to make these great, oh, I swear to God, I didn't do this. You know, more often than not, they're actually lying. Because they're trying to gain more trust from you to get you to believe them by invoking this call of, of swearing to God. And, and Wow, the, what they are bringing upon themselves by doing something that don't ever get caught up into that. It's like, you know, kids, it's probably the easiest for kids to do this. Because you may get in trouble with your parents and you don't want them to know what you did. Don't ever, ever say, I swear to God I didn't do that. If you're guilty of doing something like that, <coughs> you should learn just never to swear to God about anything, anyway. Otherwise, all you're going to end up doing is getting yourself into trouble. If you're just able to speak the truth, you don't need to go swearing to anything else. And that's that's teaching from Jesus Christ himself in Matthew chapter 5. Let's finish up this chapter, verse, uh, Joshua 9, verse number 20. See, they understand this. Even though these people were so wicked and they knew God's judgment against them, they had to destroy them. They're so wicked, yet because of that oath, they say, we, we can't do this now because we vowed, because their word was that important to be held with integrity. That if, if they, they, they recognize it, if we go back on our promise of word now, then who's ever going to believe you? When they're, when they're going and trying to do good and trying to preach the truth, no one's going to listen to them, no one's going to believe them. Joshua 9, verse number 20 says, this is what we do unto them. And we will even let them live, lest wrath be upon us. They also understood that God's wrath is going to be on us. God's going to, this is going to make God even more angry if we go and break that oath. We made the mistake by making the oath with them to begin with, but now if we go and break that, it's going to be even worse for us. This is because the oath which we swear unto them. Verse number 21, And the princes said unto them, Let them live, but let them be hewers of wood, drawers of water, and all the congregation as the princes had promised them. And Joshua called for them and spake unto them, Saying, you know, basically he rebukes them, saying, why did you lie to us? 
And the answer of in verse 24, you know, because it was certainly told thy servants how that the Lord thy God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land were before you. Therefore, we were so afraid of our lives because of you and have done this thing. Man, look, we heard what, what Moses was told to do. And you're going to wipe us out, so we're afraid. What do, you, what do you want from us? Yeah, we lied to you, you know? And they're basically just throwing themselves at the feet and saying, look, behold, we're in thy hand as it seemeth good and right unto thee to do unto us. Do. They knew they were going to die anyways. And they, you know, from their perspective, they, they, they got one over. They, you know, they ended up living. But from the, from the, and that's, that's what the world they were, from the children of God's perspective, you know, they really screwed up. But now these people have to live among them. And of course, they make them become their servants, their bond servants. They have to, you know, do all this work and hard, you know, cutting down trees and, and, and moving water around and all this stuff for the service of the house of God. That's the, what they're what they're now bond to do, but they're still there, they're still alive. And uh, verse number twenty six says, and so did he unto them and delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel that they slew them not. And Joshua made them that day hewers of wood, drawers of water for the congregation for the altar of the Lord, even unto this day in the place which he should choose. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. I pray that you would please just help us all to be true to our word and that um, you would lead us and direct us. Lord, help us to make wise decisions. Help us not to be deceived by the deceivers of this world, but to be wise in, in being diligent to do as much as we can and make sure that we're not being uh, fooled and, and deceived. And Lord, I pray that you would please just help us all remember that we need to go to you first. We need to be... Uh, seeking our counsel from you regularly, daily, dear Lord, and that you will, we know and can be confident that you will lead us and direct us. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.